Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Gada is the head of partnership and stakeholder engagement at ICAS. In her role, she is shaping and delivering on ICAR's mission, bridging the gap between evidence and practice and working in close partnership with low and middle income countries. She is developing collaborations with a range of stakeholders, including potential donors, UN bodies, NGOs, and the private sector. With a strong appreciation of the science and science policy interface, her role includes outreach and advocacy, as well as advising on ICAR's strategy. Dr. Gada has over 20 years experience in both the public and private, and private sector, leading and executing research strategies at national and international levels. She was previously the science and innovations lead on AMR at at Welcome and spent over nine years at the UK MRC search areas. During that time, she established the UK AMR Cross Council Initiative and the UK AMR Funders Forum and was on the ladies and gentlemen. We are so honored to have Dr. Gada speak to us today. And, and now I'll hand over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you, Daniel. Really, the honor is, is mine to be able to join a such an active uh, uh, group of, uh, of people who are uh, keen to play a role uh, in the future to tackle uh, AMR. And as um, Anastasia uh, kindly um, highlighted, I'm currently the head of partnership and stakeholder engagement at ICARS. I will uh, shortly um, share my screen and hopefully uh, you will be able to see um, am I correct that you are able to see my slides? Yes, we are. Perfect. So um, uh, what we uh, agreed uh, is that we will uh, go through some of the area to discuss um, advancing national action plan implementation when it comes to AMR, um, what it takes to have some of the evidence informing policymaker and I assume that many of you are students who are really generating evidence or will be generating evidence in the future to tackle this problem and play your part. I will highlight briefly what ICARS is doing to catalyze national action plan implementation, as well as our engagement uh, and activities, especially in low middle income countries. And uh, hopefully we will allow some time for question and answer. So I'll keep an eye on, on my watch so that I don't uh, overrun. So when it comes to AMR, it has been acknowledged by the World Health Assembly in 2015, which led to the Global Action Plan being set up, where there were five strategic objectives that were highlighted including improving awareness and understanding of AMR through communication and education and training, strengthening our knowledge and evidence that we know about surveillance and, and through research, as well as trying to find ways to reduce the incidence of infection through effective sanitation, hygiene, and IPC, as well as optimize the use of antimicrobials so that they are appropriately used for human and animal health, and very importantly, to develop the economic case for a sustainable investment, not only to have new medicine, but new diagnostic, vaccine, and other intervention. And that was the high-level political uh, um, background against which countries were uh, advised to go and develop their own national action plans and that each country need to have these plan, need to have the development, the endorsement at the national level, implementation plans in place, as well as monitoring and evaluation. And they were advised to take a one health approach to these plans and to have a coordination within country between human, animal agriculture and food production. This is a really nice uh, um, um, report that WHO has generated, at least from a human health perspective, where they have highlighted the process to how you do NAP implementation. Whether it is strengthening the governance in country, because when you have countries that have so many departments, so many ministries, it's very important that different sector will come work together, have mechanism in place, have a budget aligned to it, 
many countries have an AMR coordinating committee that actually discuss uh, what is needed and the next step. Then of course, country cannot tackle everything at the same time, especially countries that have low resources. So prioritizing the activity, where is the burden in country X? What do they wanna do? It could be human, it could be animal, or it could be environment. Then a very important tool that WHO has generated is the costing tool. Because the fact that you identify the challenge and you want to amend it, you still need to cost and budget it. So you are able to tackle it while you are informed about where to bring that funding from, but as well to be clear if there is external donor that this is what you really need from them. Mobilize resources and here even beyond the budget, the capacity building, the advocacy, such as the role that you are playing when you are advocating among students and beyond to the need of AMR. So mobilizing the national resources. Very importantly, implementing those activities. And I think this is where ICARs play a really important role where we test the intervention before they are implemented. And I'll come to that a bit later. Importantly, which is something that should not be forgotten is monitoring. Are we on the right track? Is a country X on the right track by reducing unnecessary antibiotic use by having better infection prevention and control. These are all very important steps in the processes. Now we have all of this documentation at hand, but when we look at the database for tackling AMR, which is the country self-assessment database, it's called TRACS, that allows different country to report back how they have been doing on an annual basis when it comes to NAP development and um, implementation. And I only picked here one, uh, one question that they ask about the country progress with the development of their national action plan. I added the link that you can go and have a look. It's really interesting to look at your own country, look at other countries and see different type of sectors, how they have uh, answers within human animal as well as environment. What we see really, and, and what we, uh, the ambition is for country to be all dark green. All dark green, that means you have a national action plan in place that has been approved, it has implementation plan in place, and it has been budgeted. So there is money that's be, been mobilized to deliver on that national action plan. And we see from the map that we are far from there. Maybe 88% responded that they have a um, national action plan, but only 20% of those have a fully financed national action plan, which means that these documents are sitting on the shelf awaiting to be implemented. So we do have a problem when it comes to implementing those national action plans. But why is this? Do we not know the burden of AMR? The evidence is really out there. The latest paper from, um, from the Global Burden of Disease uh, team shows very clearly that it's still a problem. It shows that in 2019, there's been at least that 1.27 million deaths attributed to AMR, that the burden is highest in low middle income country, that Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest deaths. And if we look at the paper, there's as well a, many reasons for why AMR is in such situation. In some places, it's a problem with infection prevention. In others, it's unnecessary use of antibiotics. And I'm sure in some other setting, it's lack of access to antibiotic. And we, need to, we know what we need to, to do. It's not that we don't know what, we, what is needed. The intervention are, appropriate use of antibiotic for human, animal, as well as um, the waste in the environment. We know that we need new antibiotics and diagnostics to help us with this. And we do know that better infection prevention control and biosecurity are necessary. So what's missing? Why is this evidence not informing policy change? Is it because it's political? Some of the individual may not be uh, understanding the need for, for the steps? Is it because the evidence provided is, is way too complex that no decision being made? Or is it a lack of leadership because we are going around talking about it, but there is no steps being taken? And I've looked and reminded myself of a really nice um, paper here, and I added the link at the bottom by Davis in 2012, 
where he was looking at the evidence and how it influenced policy and practice. Many of us, and now as a scientist in my younger age, were generating the evidence and the fact that it's there, the understanding is policymaker will take it. But is it true? The reality is there are many factors that affect policymaking. The fact that people who make the decision are human being at the end of the day, they have their values, their beliefs, their ideology, but they have their experience or lack of it, their expertise and their judgment as well. They are looking from a different perspective. They're looking at what resources is available. They're looking at how much bureaucracy it will take them, you know, how many layers of activity they need to do to implement that evidence, but as well they're influenced by lobbyists and pressure groups. Similarly, the evidence that we as scientists look into it is in many times, um, it, it's not self-evidence or definitive. We write paper, we publish, but actually it doesn't tell the user what they need to do. And that's a problem in many cases. It needs to help make informed judgment about the likely impact of an intervention. Does the evidence come and say, if you do this, this is what will happen? It has a lot of uncertainty in, in it because that's the nature of scientific evidence. It gives you what observational studies, in some places it has tested in intervention, but it doesn't mean that if you do hand washing in country A versus country B, you will have the same impact. And policymaker at the other end are really keen to know how much of an impact this intervention will do, how much it will cost, and cost them and how will they do it in the best and easy and most cost efficient way. So researcher and policymaker really have different notion of evidence. For scientists, it's a sort of accumulation of knowledge that will progress. For policymaker, they want something now, they want something they can act upon that's quick. Usually in many countries, their role may be over three or four years. And the reality is research take time and impact of research take time. And this is not how policy usually work. So how do we inform policy? How do we actually move into this stage where we are a little bit more effective and efficient as scientists and as a researcher to inform the policy. Historically, we have been very much a bottom up. Scientists go do the research, accumulate the data, publish it, maybe do a policy brief and have it ready there, expecting that the policymaker will take it on. So we need to know who to influence. But most importantly, we need to know not only what exactly we want to change, who we want to do it, but when. Historically, we have been too late in engaging with policymaker. Maybe it's a good idea to start thinking differently, and I'll present how ICARS is doing it, where we can bring them early on from the beginning so that they tell us where the issue is, and we can work in partnership with them early on in the game. Because knowing when to reach out to a policymaker is important. If it is election time, they don't have time to think about it unless you're giving them a quick win. If it's a budget cycle, they have so many other challenges at the same time, yet it could be an opportunity. Building relationship and a good network within policymaker is crucial. They could be your ally, your advocate. Sweden and the UK now have AMR ambassador. That means these are experts that talk up to the government, telling them how things are, informing them, advising us, being champion for AMR. And then understanding that policy development is actually not linear. There's a lot of people that are involved. It goes back and forth. And we have to be understanding that just the fact that evidence is there is not enough. And it is inherently political, as we said, policymaker have their own values, expertise and experience. But engagement need to be planned, outreach activity needs to be planned, and the way we communicate is very important. And when we go to a policymaker, it's important to highlight the problem that AMR caused society, but it's even much better if we articulate a solution. Nobody, especially after COVID now, 
Nobody wants more problem. Tell me what's the solution, how we can solve this problem. And more importantly, technically, politically, but as well financially, how much is it gonna cost me? It takes time, it needs commitment, and it needs a lot of patience. But at the same time, what's really important is keep on monitoring the engagement with the policymaker. If one way is not working, let's have a look at a different way. So where is ICARS in all of this? ICAR really is a catalyst for NAP implementation. It is an international organization working in partnership with government in low middle income country to develop and test context specific solution for AMR. ICARS provide not only funding, but technical expertise as well across the one health spectrum. It was initiated by Denmark, but it's now an independent entity that's able to attract funding from a range of uh, donor and foundation. And it has currently 27 employees from a range of countries. And why is ICARS needed? Building on what we have just said early on, there is a gap in implementation. And ICARS is trying to play a role there by providing evidence-based solution that are cost-effective, context-specific, with the ambition that they will be sustainable, having a one health breath, as well as filling the gap between policy and practice. So our mission is very much working with low middle income country as a partner, as an equal partner, trying to develop and test these uh, uh, questions and intervention and help with the implementation. We have core principles that we work with. The fact that the solution has to be country owned it's very important that when you identify a problem, you own the solution in a certain country rather than another donor coming and telling you, we want you to be um, developing a project in surveillance, for example, or in animal health, when the country itself may not have identified that as a priority topic. So country ownership of the research and the evidence and the outcome is crucial. A one health breath is important. I don't need to repeat that the experience that we had with COVID and the interaction between the human and animal system is really very intertwined, but as well with the environment and the setting that we live in, whether it's the building environment or the more wild environment. Partnership is crucial to advance anything. No one can do anything like this. And when you have a problem that has been described as a wicked problem, it needs multiple stakeholders to come together but it needs to be solution focused. As we said earlier on, we can't only identify the problem, we need to identify the solution and have a very targeted approach to what we want to change. And keep in mind the sustainability, whatever outcome and evidence has been generated has to fit in within existing infrastructure of that country. So we talked about implementation bottleneck before. We talked about if there is lack of political momentum or policy commitment, then the NAP implementation will suffer. If there is no ownership, then the implementation will suffer as well. And when we talk about ownership, not only from the research community, but the policymaker as well, those policymakers need to be uh, brought in early on so that the shaping of the problem and the solution is done together. And very importantly is strengthening the infrastructure in terms of people as well as uh, resources. With all of these different variables, then there is a chance to have some intervention that could potentially be uh, implemented at a larger scale. So for truly sustainable solution, we need political will, ownership with, throughout the whole stakeholder chain, to have things context specific, country capacity need to be looked into. We need to understand behavior of those involved and we need to have the economics at the heart of it. So this is where ICAR strategy uh, come into five pillars really. Um, the first pillar is to develop and test context specific solution in partnership with low middle income countries. Pillar two, which is very much what we have articulated earlier on, is when you already have evidence, 
that evidence may not have been translated into policy program and practice. And is there a role for ICARS that it can play there? Pillar three is to advocate for countries to have a voice when it comes to these solutions, so that these solutions are context specific and country owned, and they are informed by what we call intervention and implementation research. And very importantly, having a targeted capacity and capability building where we are, as we are progressing with the project, we always keep an eye on enhancing the capacity building of those delivering on the intervention, as well as strengthening the health system. As a new organization that's been only three year old, it's very important that ICARS become a trustworthy partner and a platform for delivering these solutions. And this is something that is of great importance to the team at ICARS. So I'll go very briefly through some of these pillars and give some example, especially those examples that are based in the African continent. Pillar one, which is looking at testing and context specific solution. We talked about a bottom up approach from the research community, but we haven't so far talked about top down, which is very much engaging with the policymaker. And this is where the model of ICAR is really interesting because it engage with the government at the diplomatic level, it build on national action plan, but it as well mobilize the resources from those local researcher and other stakeholder at a national level. This way you have a top-down, a bottom-up approach where you have a collaboration so that whenever that intervention is being developed, it's been showing evidence, it doesn't come as a surprise to the policymaker. And it's very interesting when you have dialogue with the policymaker, the different aspect that as a scientist, you may not have included originally in the project, such as engagement with managers in hospital, if the intervention is tackling hospital uh, AMR, or an economic business model, or a communication strategy. These are all elements that may not have been part of what a local researcher is involved in. So again, a top-down and a bottom-up approach, securing commitment from the ministerial level, having these projects develop with the local expertise and bringing and building on other initiative already because there is no need really to duplicate, but really importantly to support each other. Your example here, one here in the human health that's happening in Zambia, where the Zambian Ministry of Health was really interested in looking at blood screen infection and urinary tract infection and seeing how they can reduce inappropriate antibiotic usage. They wanted to look at some of these uh, compliance uh, with appropriate use using some guidelines. And the ministry brought on board the University of Zambia Teaching Hospital, as well as the Zambian National Public Health Institute. The appetite was to look at Increase compliance to the treatment guideline, appropriate antibiotic use, what are the dose, the route, the duration, changes of treatment and how much would this cost, and give recommendation to the ministry that are one of the stakeholders on the project, as well as cost analysis. The project has just started and the uh, universities are delivering on it, but the ministry is the one that set up the project were at the table from the beginning, had a memorandum of understanding with ICARS, and they are always kept informed of the progress of that project. Another example is more within the animal sector in Tanzania, where the Ministry of Livestock and Fishery and the Ministry of Agriculture were really keen on optimizing vaccination and biosecurity regime in commercial poultry in Tanzania. This is because there is an increased demand for poultry in Africa, and there is always an increased risk that there are diseases and that antibiotics is being used for prevention of infection rather than treatment. So the project was to look at optimizing a range of vaccine and biosecurity measures that are available but currently not used, and in taking into consideration the social and economic aspect of this investment. Because it's very important that when we are looking at the farmers to understand where they are coming from, to make sure they are engaged and a very active player. 
and that whatever intervention has been introduced makes sense to their livelihood. Again, the partners are a combination of the ministries, the university, as well as other institute uh, in Zanzibar. And the aim is to reduce antimicrobial uh, use, reduce the disease, so very much the health of the poultry and improve growth. And make sure that we support a collaboration on farming training and produce a business case that is suitable and appropriate for the farmer. And the last but not least, another project in Tanzania, but very much here looking at the spread of antimicrobials, uh, resistant microbes through treatment. So again, poultry manure is very desirable as a fertilizer for food production, but because there has been overuse of antibiotics, there's always risk of AMR contamination through the food chain. And the team in Tanzania were really very interested to see if they can introduce new ways of treating the manure and processing it so that it's a, safer to be used as a fertilizer. And that will, of course, create employment opportunity for small businesses, for composting and fertilizer sale, and will inform and revise some of the policy that the government has in terms of I spoke about existing evidence that's already out there and how some of the existing evidence may not have been taken up by government. And when we look at funding that has happened throughout the last five years, we find that there's a lot of evidence that have been published and generated, but many have not been translated. And it's important to see where, which, are, which opportunities are out there that ICARS can help translate and then the way to do it is to reach out to those policymakers and see why has this evidence not been translated? What is missing from that evidence? In many places, it could be a cost effectiveness is not been articulated. What are the barrier and the enabler of the uptake? Bring stakeholder together and see if additional evidence is needed. And here the additional evidence will be led by the ministries and by the policymaker. To give you an example, in Colombia, we're working with um, the UK government, GAMREF Fund, and with Pork Colombia, which is a representative of many swine farmers, as well as a producer uh, and slaughterhouses. So the swine production is really consume one of the highest level of antimicrobial compared to other livestock. And there are diagnostic platforms that are, are there that could help critically reduce the antimicrobial use. However, these diagnostics have not been used because they were deemed to be too complex and too expensive. And the project that we have done with Port Columbia and with GAMRIF is very much looking at the challenges and the opportunity in terms of looking at the diagnostics in pig farms in Colombia, and that how positioning the diagnostic tools as health heard for the farmer as better, more hygienic way of run a farm to understand when diseases occur and to provide support to the farmer, it, both in uh, uh, collecting the sample, but as well as reading the sample was really deemed to be the way forward. This project has just terminated and hopefully uh, outcome will be uh, socialized even broadly but it looks like looking at this project, the outcomes are very positive. The farmer now are a little bit more engaged with the diagnostic and it's proven that it is quite beneficial in terms of cost and economics. But I know that the team wants to not only publish, but uh, socialize this with the policymaker more closely and discuss how best to implement that beyond the number of farms that have been um, tested in. Another aspect is the role and the importance of including gender into some of the intervention development. The reality is we do know that many of the intervention has to be targeted to certain population. For example, UTI is really more prominent within women. But in many cases, when intervention are being developed, they do not take a gender lens to them, neither in their development nor in their outreach to the right population. And what we have done in partnership with 
IDRC in Canada and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Denmark. And with implementing partner, which is the Human Science Research Council and Mahidol University in Jive Media working together about how we can bring a gender lens into some of the existing evidence so that we can see, are these evidence fit for purpose? Are they targeted to the right population? And if not, do we need to strengthen some of these evidence so they are better implemented? Another example is very much, we talked about um, top-down and bottom-up approach, but there is one of the tools that Welcome Trust have generated, which is called the Responsive Dialogues uh, Toolkit. And this is very much to engage with the, pub, with the communities, the public and those people who care for the community to make sure that the intervention not only has been decided by the ministries and the researcher, but have taken into consideration the community base that is the end user of that intervention. So we're using here an existing tool to strengthen the public engagement, as well as the community engagement in deciding on the intervention and testing that intervention. And in this case here, it is in Zambia for UTI, and it will complement the other project that we mentioned that was led by the Ministry of Health. A third pillar is very much advocating for context specific and country owned AMR solution. This is because we feel that it's very important to raise awareness and mobilize international commitment when it comes to these AMR solutions, that they need to be context specific. They shouldn't really be um, uh, totally dissociated from the, the country and the context where the solution is being tested. It's very important to play a role in influencing funders and policymakers to prioritize and increase investment in AMR and ELMIC, and to develop hubs that country can learn from each other, especially South South countries learning from each other and engaging together with some of the solutions. And here we're working with the AMR R&D hub, which has a big dashboard of research that has been supported. And we're looking at what sort of intervention are already out there and what role can ICAR play in strengthening some of the translation of such evidence so that it can have higher impact. We have seconded a senior consultant to the quadripartite in Geneva to work very closely on the One Health AMR research ag agenda, looking very much at intervention and implementation research and what is needed when it comes to low middle income country. Last but not least is very much a targeted approach to capacity building and capability. And this is strengthening the capacity of the people as well as the health system with partner country to make sure that they can test and, and develop these solution and implementation on implementing them on the ground. There's a lot of training happening as part of the project. There's a lot of strengthening of human and veterinary health system as part of that project, but as well as creating champion and AMR player that will continue beyond the life of our project. A couple of examples is a strong partnership that we have built with ILRI, which is the International Livestock Research Institute in Kenya. This is part of their uh, work at creating a center of excellence that will bring human and veterinarian clinical microbiology laboratory in Africa. It will strengthen some of the antimicrobial susceptibility testing capability, and it will offer training to many of the project lead that we are supporting and beyond. Another very fruitful uh, um, partnership that we have, and this is in Georgia, in East Europe, is a strong partnership with VSAC, the British Society for Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, to create a MOOC, which is a massive open online course on antibiotic stewardship um, for surgical antibiotic prophylaxis. And this course will have a general module that will be relevant to different setting, but then we'll have a targeted two module for Georgia's context. And we hope that that model could be another model that we can translate it in another setting 
where again, we can target it to the different uh, problem in different country. Teaching material will be made uh, widely available to increase the awareness beyond that project. And last but not least is a very strong partnership we have with React Africa, React in general, but React Africa, where we are looking and building on the existing very useful tools that they have for lab implementation and testing them in certain settings. And here we have started working with them in Zambia on some of these testing of the tools. Last is a partnership we just announced with Radboud University, where um, there's a masterclass in AMS that has been developed by Radboud. And now these um, a masterclass will be providing training and teaching tool adapted to different resources, to low resource context, as well as low middle income country that will build sustainable in-country capacity. So we have a model of train the trainers so that these train those that have been trained, they can go and train others. And then they will ensure there is a structure and cost effectiveness of running some of these courses. I think the course will be delivered to 400 participants over three years, which will include a lot of healthcare profession engage in some of our project and beyond. This is a snapshot of where we are currently at. We have 15 uh, countries engaged so far, 33 projects, more than 70 research ministries and partners. And because of the audience here, I have uh, put a, a, a lens here on what we are doing in Africa and included in blue those countries where we are still co-developing some of the project, just for you to have um, an oversight of where we are. And we're moving forward with different regions as well. ICAR's model is to work in partnership, partnership with low middle income countries, government, partnership with funding agencies, and very importantly, partnership with implementing partners. Those are the partner without whom we cannot really deliver on some of the project. There are loads of initiative that's already out there, whether international organization, national and international network, existing initiative, research organization, as well as the private sector. And I'll pause here and thank you very much for uh, listening. Let me stop sharing this. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you, thank you so much. Okay, stop sharing. Daniel, you, you, can, you can go ahead. Oh, so sorry, Anastasia. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dada, for that uh, really wonderful presentation. We appreciate uh, the great work that you're doing. And uh, on my end, I've seen the growth of uh, ICAS right from 2019. I think it has really been a tremendous journey, and you've already impacted uh, uh, a lot uh, in the MR uh, scene. Uh, so at this juncture, maybe we can just open the floor for anyone with questions to uh, go ahead and uh, Maybe you can raise your hand as you usually do, or you can either type your question in the chat box uh, if you have any question. Thank you. It's worth saying, Daniel, that I'm more than happy for the PDF that I shared with you to be shared more widely. I know this is um, a lot of information all jumped into 40 slides. Um, so, um, please feel free to, uh, to access these, this PDF. And if there's any uh, interest and you want to follow up, I think you have the generic uh, contact uh, detail, but I'm more than happy for my email to be shared as well. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gada. I think uh, for still digesting uh, the, the information, maybe as we uh, digest, um, I would also want to maybe ask a question, just a simple one, because um, most of the uh, most of the projects are like pilot projects. Um, maybe from your experience so far, um, how do you think? What would be the key in incentivizer, or what would really uh, make you know uh, our governments uh, to fund their local EMR projects, like? Uh, what are, from your experience, what are some of the key, how can uh, some of the key, uh, how do we need to frame it very well such that, you know, 
Uh, we have now the local governments taking out uh, and uh, funding so at least uh, we're able to achieve this uh, sustainable, uh, yes. you know, sustainability of the great work that you're doing. Yes. Over to you. I think there's a couple of things. There's the global AMR landscape, which you and I may not have actually control over, you know, where there is global pressure onto country. Like yesterday, a uh, couple of days ago, there was the high level interministerial uh, meeting where different ministry got together and committed to uh, reducing AMR. So this is very high political level that all countries need to deliver by. There's as well the uh, dashboard and the survey that the quadripartite has out there where countries start comparing to each other and seeing, oh, my country hasn't done a good job at all compared to my other fellow countries. So there is that peer pressure by other countries. We don't have much of a power to it other than highlighting some of the information. But very importantly within the country is trying to see and learn from each other. So articulating a good practice and a good project and a good case study that has worked in country X and taking that to your AMR coordinating committee to highlight the fact that, look, country X is making effort to have inappropriate use of antibiotic under control. It's doable, it's suitable, maybe we should try it here. This is one angle. Articulating and analyzing some of the evidence to make it a little bit more close to the understanding of the policymaker. And very importantly is show the quick wins. If you come and say, you know, COVID has been a massive problem. Now there is another massive problem. I understand that we do need to highlight AMR, but a political leader does not need another problem, does not need more bad news. So instead of having that communication, come and say, we can build on the effort that we have put for COVID and we can tackle another problem via what we have done for COVID. Many places have done good capacity building for microbiological testing. They have done good hand hygiene. Everybody was washing hands. Well, that actually works quite nicely for uh, AMR as well as for uh, COVID. A lot of awareness raising and looking at the political system in country. In the UK, for example, where I'm currently uh, talking to you from, you can write to your MP and pressurize. Ha that has some impact. It doesn't have a lot of impact, but this, and then you tackle it via evidence, and then you reach out to some of the champion in government, and then you put cases forward to how other countries are doing it. It has to be a long-term vision rather than one, specific things that has been done. And then you as a student, you are the future of your country and you can provide some of this patience and long-term investment into it where you can keep on going even if you fail from the first time. So I, I would say it's a multitude of intervention so that countries can show that this is an important topic. And to be honest, a lot of the African countries have had a lot of interest in AMR. It's a very vibrant, um, it's a very vibrant continent when it comes to AMR. So well done to all those that have shown in, uh, interest and have put effort there. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gada, for really that elaborative response. I can see Pius uh, had some questions. Maybe Pius, are you able to unmute and maybe uh, share via? via by a mic. Okay. I think his question um, is about the AMS, right? Is the is the is the program that that we are running next year? Yeah, we just um, started it and announced it now. So I'm hoping that very soon we will be able to um, just articulate which location it will be done. And then uh, we can put it a little bit more widely. So we will be sharing soon. We just announced the, part, announced the partnership now. So uh, keep tuned. If you're not part of the ICAR circulation list, maybe it's worth signing up so that you can receive some of the ICAR's news. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, the other question I think he was asking is, uh, is on resources, uh, which are already available. Or do we have like a... You know, a platform where uh, we are able to access this so that we don't uh, end up then duplicating 
uh, research or evidence that's already existing? This is a very good uh, question. Um, I don't think there is any uh, global evidence that I can direct you to few. The AMR R&D Global Hub is, is one platform where you can see some of the evidence um, that's already, some of the projects that have been funded. But I totally agree with you. Having an oversight of what's happening globally in AMR is challenging. I understand that the independent um, advisory uh, committee that's been set up, uh, the independent panel that will be set up by the quadripartite will have some of the role of looking at the existing evidence and seeing what's already out there. There are some really good work that React Africa and other civil society have looked at specific country and seen how the progress has happened over the last five years. I know many countries now have national action plan that's due to be um, moving into its next phase, so NAP 2.0. And as such, the AMR coordinating committee within each country will be looking at what has been delivered in the last five years. So engaging with them is important. Understanding the priority of what has not been delivered will be really uh, crucial. So it's a combination of looking at existing effort by the quadripartite, looking at effort by civil society like React Africa, but as well looking at some of the funding that uh, the hub, for example, has invested in in your own country. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I think Obino, you had a question too. I'd seen your hand up or has it been addressed? Can maybe respond? Okay, my, my concern was, uh, especially on a national action plan, sir, uh, which uh, to me, I think they are just maybe written, then they are put on a shelf somewhere to wait for a review. Is there anything like, especially in LMIC, LMIC countries, uh, you found out that um, MR and MS, they are never been streamed. You found out that maybe I'll, maybe I'll talk about Kenya and where you come from. It's surely given us an added, responsibility so maybe you have another work that you are doing in a, maybe in a country then you are told also do this as a an added responsibility so at the end of at the end of the time you will not make more emphasis on that uh, added response because you have other work to do so my question is is there anything that can be done so that this mainstream of amr and ams in a L lmic can because when you look at the research when they said about in 20 since 2050, we'll have 10 million will be who, uh, deaths and the causes will be uh, antimicrobial resistant. And majority, like for example, Africa, about 4.1 million will die because of that. Is there mm -hmm. anything? Of, of course, I joined later. I don't know if the speaker uh, said anything uh, on that. Is there anything that we can do so that we can mainstream MR and MS, especially in LMIC countries? Yes. So you see, um, um, when some of the global burden of disease uh, paper was published, um, and the burden has been really highlighted to sub-Saharan Africa and some of the African countries, the reason in many places was um, infection prevention and control as much as uh, better and appropriate use of antibiotics. So different setting will have a different reason for why the, the burden is higher. And it, the important thing in some country where you have issues with infection prevention and control is to strengthen the existing system that you have in place, the human health system and the animal health system. AMR cannot be looked at in isolation to other things. It has to be part of everything that the country has. And if you strengthen health system and animal system, then you will have less infection. Then you will have less an AMR. So in some setting, it's like this, depending on the usage of uh, antimicrobial and whether they are unnecessary or actually um, they are overprescribed. In other setting, and the paper again advised for the age, some of the Asian uh, country where they have a lot of access to antibiotic, that the problem that there was inappropriate use of antibiotics. So you need to look at every single country and see what is the burden for that country and where the burden is coming from. Is it because of animal health, human health? Is it the food system? Once you have identified the problem, 
then you can take the action. At the moment, the action and everything has been at such a high level, a global level, that many countries don't know where to get started from. And this is where I feel the ICARS model is quite interesting because it talks to each country and say, country X, what is the burden of AMR? Where do you feel it most? And which project do you want to deliver and develop? And this is where the prioritization start. Georgia, for example, as a country, we started with the human health sector. There was unnecessary use of antibiotic in hospital. They really wanted to test the guidelines in their own context. Then over time, the Ministry of Agriculture came and, came and said, we have the same problem in poultry. Then now we are in partnership with two ministries, right? In Kenya, we are just about starting working with the Kenyan government. And it's one of those projects under co-development and hopefully it will progress over the next few months. But A, for us as ICARS, building the trust with the country, helping and working together to identify where is the burden and then shaping up the project. US student, I think it's very important to look at what is available in your country. Where is the burden? When you are doing your research, where is the need? Dialogue with the policymaker will be crucial so that it can inform which direction you want to put your project into. So that is crucial. And for you as generate, generator of evidence, this is at the heart of NAP implementation. The reality is evidence is really important. Articulating the evidence and bringing policymaker early on in the shaping of the evidence is crucial too. Some countries have better model than others, have better governance than others, and have better committees that are able to engage with the evidence. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gada, for that. I, it has really been a wonderful session. We really thank are you for making time and i also really want to thank you and the icas team uh because i started following your work from a very early age i think when icas was still in its uh young days i remember engaging in conversations with hell and uh, uh you know uh those back days uh so i've really been following your work and i believe it's a very good work that you're doing and uh, you know there's a lot of impact and uh, i love that you approach it from an aspect of collaborating with you know uh different key stakeholders and you know making these solutions country owned and uh, re uh address to the local realities so thank you so much i would also want to recognize uh the presence of Sefi, uh, yes. communications manager also at ICAS. Uh, we appreciate you, Sefi, for being around. And thank you too for always also uh, promoting our communication in the different spaces and yeah, uh, promoting our campaigns. And uh, at this juncture, I just also want to thank our, uh, our participants. Thank you so much. I know it was uh, maybe a bit earlier than our usual sessions, but we really also appreciate you for even uh, making it uh, uh, this time. And uh, with that, I'd just like to hand over to my co-coordinator, Anastasia, uh, for some final words. Then I think we'll then hear from you, uh, uh, the final words from you, uh, Dr. Gada, then I think we can call it a day. Thanks so much. Over to you, Anastasia. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gada, for being here. And uh, for any time to, to talk to us and show us what ICAS is doing. Thank you so much to our participants. Uh, thank you very much, Steffi, for being here as well. Um, I think with that, um, let me hand over to Dr. Gada for the final remarks. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a privilege. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> That's important. Uh, uh, without the next generation, I think uh, uh, some of us, um, you know, uh, I, I look at my daughter, she's 11, and I hope in the future she will make an impact. I think you are all on the right track for making a dent in AMR, and we need your effort, and we need into your um, wisdom, into engaging and bringing new ideas to the table. Keep challenging, keep challenging your policymaker, and don't give up. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you so much once again, Dr. Gada, Sefi, my co coordinator, Anastasia, and all the participants. And I wish you all a wonderful evening. Bye, everyone. Thank bye you. bye.